In the first story there is video footage that I will be including into the video. I will also be leaving links in the description in case any of you guys want to look at the footage. And with that being said, let's get into the first story. My girlfriend and I came home together and walked inside. We live in a major city on a nice neighbourhood with a small yard like many city row houses. I saw that the water pitcher I filled this morning was empty, which I found strange. So I filled it and came back out to water the plants. When I walked outside, a man was standing at our gate, a few feet from me. I ignored him and watered the plants, and when I turned around, he was still there. He looked like a normal guy, our age, white upper middle class type. I said hi, and he asked if I lived here. I said yes. He asked my name. I told him. He stood silent. I asked if he lived here. He said, somewhere around here. I watered the other plants. He asked how long I lived here. I said a few years. He said how long exactly. I found it unsettling and I told him that I didn't keep count. He asked where I was from originally. I said West Virginia. He stood silent. I made a deliverance joke he didn't get. He asked where my girlfriend was from. She was inside. That meant he had watched us come inside and had been there since before we were home. I said it was nice to meet him and offered my hand to shake his. He said his name was James. I went back inside. I told her how weird it was and before I could explain, he was pounding on the door saying my name. I came out and unlocked the first of two doors. I asked what he needed. He wanted to come inside. He said someone hired him and he knew everything about us. He repeated a few times that he couldn't talk outside and needed to come in. I told him no. He eventually said someone was watching him and he couldn't tell me what he wanted but he could give me a general idea. He offered to empty his pockets, which he did. Headphones, lighter, cigarette pack. He acted as if he had something urgent to tell us that he couldn't talk about. I asked him to get the point. He told me something about a revolution. I told him I had to go. He asked what I needed to do. I said, life stuff. I closed the door. He walked back out onto the street. I could see out of the window that he was looking in and another man approached him. They were talking about us, saying my name for several minutes. A neighbour came down to do laundry. I told her to lock the door. She said that they creeped her out because they were talking until she walked by and they were silent. We called the cops. They took minutes to get here and the two men left seconds before their cars arrived. The police could not find them. My security camera doesn't record the best audio and it records 15 seconds of video based on movement and sound. I purchased it because our mail was being stolen a few years ago. This is him walking away. Update, second video from before he walked away when he pounded on the door and we came to see what he wanted. How you been? Fine. What's in your pocket? Okay, cool. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I intentionally unzipped my jacket for all this. What's up, man? I got I got I got stuff to do. So if you want to, what, 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 what? like, mm -hmm. what, you know, life and stuff. We got regular everyday stuff. So just kind of fill me in on what's uh, going on and. Well, there's a revolution going on. Okay. Um, I'll give you my email or something. How's that? Well, this is kind of a one-time opportunity here, and I was just drafting you this man, dude. Like, let me sit on the couch. I'll give you everything out of my pockets. Uh, I'm sorry, man. I gotta get going. And you have a good night.
I have learnt a lot from being a dispatcher, mainly in the sense that sometimes the most dangerous individuals are the ones who are a danger to themselves. From my time of being a dispatcher, I can wholeheartedly say that the majority of calls made are regarding people who suffer from some type of mental illness. Some of the worst calls are made from teenagers that are suffering from mental illnesses. Sometimes, it feels like their whole world is falling apart, and at that moment in time, you are their last hope. Whatever you say impacts them greatly, and sometimes, it's just not enough. The hardest calls for me are the ones where you can't save them, that no matter what you say or how much you empathise with them, they're too far gone already. For confidentiality reasons, all names have been made up. This is one of the odd times where I work the day shift. This call came in shortly after 1pm. 911, what's your emergency? Help. I need your help please. The young man stuttered into the phone. Okay, can you tell me where you are and what happened? I need, need you to, to stop me before I, I do something stupid. He was crying silently into the phone. What are you planning on doing? I softened my voice. I'm going to kill them all. Wait, kill? Why would you want to kill someone? I tried to contact the cell phone provider for more information. They all make fun of me. I'm not a faggot. I'm so tired of it. They never stop. No one does anything about it. He was sobbing. What's your name? Talk to me. Calls like these were cries for help. Teenagers who didn't know where to turn. Talking was a 50-50 chance that it would end great or end badly. M Matthew, what am I supposed to do? He managed to say between sobs. Well, first you have to tell me what happened. I need to know what's going on so I can help you, Matthew. Last week, I was at school and Bradley and Connor thought it would be funny to steal my phone. What did they do with your phone after they stole it? I had pictures of me, naked pictures, and they posted it on my Facebook. I deleted it but everybody's still making fun of me. Oh, I can see why you're so upset, but will killing them really be the answer? Why are they allowed to ruin my life, and I can't ruin theirs? That's not fair. Have you talked to any adults about it? Like your teachers or your parents? Dad d doesn't care about me. His stuttering was getting increasingly worse. What about teachers? The cell phone provider finally got back to me with an approximate location. He was at a local high school. They all <clears throat> love the popular kids. Not me. He sounded defeated. High school's tough, Matthew. I wasn't a popular kid either. I know what it's like to get bullied. R really? I could hear the sound of relief in his voice. Yeah, and do you want to know how I got through it? I changed schools, and then I made a whole bunch of friends. Nobody wants to be friends with me. They all think I'm weird because I, because of my stutter. I don't think you're weird. I'm sure when you change school that there will be somebody else that doesn't think you're weird either. I, I can't change s schools. My, my dad won't let me. Any previous hope in his voice was now gone. Well, I'm sure that when he finds out about how upset you are, he'll change his mind. I heard the faint sound of the school's overhead system. They were conducting a lockdown. I am going to go to jail. He started to cry again. No, you won't. You haven't hurt anybody, right? They're just going to make sure you are okay. They are just going to, th to think I'm a freak. Listen to me, Matthew. You are not a freak. Where are you right now? I'm in the, I'm in the change room. I locked it so... So nobody could g get in. Okay. I want you to think about this for a minute. I know they are bullies and I know they deserve to be hurt like how they hurt you. But are you really any better than they are if you do this? He stayed silent for a moment. I guess I, I guess you are, you are right. He was crying again. Look, I know it's hard but you are so much better than that. Better than them. If you do this, you'll have to live with the guilt. And you really don't want to do that, do you? I I know what I, I have to, to do. Matthew, I can make sure you get the help you need. You don't need to do anything, okay? Please let me help you. My heart was pounding. You don't understand. No one does. I heard him set the phone down and shuffle around a little bit. That's when I heard the sound of something falling to the ground and the sound of Matthew gasping for air. I was screaming into the phone, begging him to answer, knowing well enough what he had just done. I sent details to the dispatch and sent an ambulance over. Eventually they found the boy's body hanging from one of the pipes in the boy's locker room. 
Matthew was a freshman in high school and only 14 at the time. He had a loaded gun in his bag, as well as a suicide note. It turns out Matthew's father was a schizophrenic who would often skip on taking his pills, forcing Matthew to take care of him. The combination of having an unstable home life and being bullied day in and day out at school, Matthew had had enough. In addition to finding Matthew's body, they found another body in the showers attached to the locker room. The boy had been stabbed in the jugular with a pencil. It was Connor, a senior that had taken joy in bullying Matthew. There's always going to be a part of me that will always believe that there could have been more said, that he could have managed to say something to get through to him.